Thank you, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar and the LitGrid team. It's an honor to be here today to address you on the web. The faculty, the students who have, in fact, been part of the LitGrid team for a very long time. At the outset, let me pay my respect and homage to the memory of Dr. P. K. Rajan the architect of LitGrid, who started the literary journey that has now entered or is continuing, I wouldn't say ended, is continuing to be an international journal of repute. And the credit of this goes, of course, to Dr. Ajay Kumar and his team who have been able to continue the good work that Dr. P. K. Rajan started. So congratulations to the LitGrid team for continuing the good work with the journal and for having introduced a web series of this nature, particularly at a time when we cannot be together in person, but we can be together on a platform like this. It is a sad moment for all of us, especially during the pandemic times, uh, to recall that during this time, so many of human beings around the world, over a hundred million have been victims of this pandemic and many have died. So let me pay my respects and homage to the memory of all those who have lost their lives in this pandemic. The subject that I have chosen for this webinar is topical. And as Dr. Ajay Kumar said, I was trying to bring together a number of concepts of different disciplines in order to understand what pandemic experiences. Spatiality is something that we associate with physics. Concepts are something that we associate with mathematics. Pandemics is something that we associate with science and rationality. And literature is something that we associate with human experiences. So this uh, one hour talk is intended to bring these various disciplines together into a space in which we live today. In order to enter this topic, I thought one of the first things that I could do, sorry, uh, is to start with a picture. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with. And this is the picture of Greece, of Athens, a picture that was presented by Holland to Greece many years after the tragedy at Athens and Greece. We know of this tragedy through the stories that Homer has told us in his Iliad. We know of this tragedy also from Sophocles in his book, Oedipus, the King. And this particular picture uh, actually reflects the helplessness and the fear of the people when confronted with a pandemic of this nature. We also know that this pandemic, this plague, that affected the, uh, the people of Greece and Athens was something that was sent, they believed that it was something that was sent by Apollo in anger for having taken Chryseus in bondage. And Agamemnon was asked to return the uh, slave uh, back to her father. So, uh, this becomes the uh, context in which we see early 
um, what you would say, literature, human experiences that go back to the time before Christ. In the Bible also, we have references to the plague as viewed as one of God's punishments for the sins of man. So there was a supernatural element that was associated with the pandemic. The plagues that affected Greece, the plague that affected Israel and the people of Israel. And the feeling that wherever a plague came during that part of the uh, historical period was somehow related to the sins of man and it God's punishment for the sins that had been committed by man. So there was a religious connotation that was associated with the pandemic. But fear was something that controlled the human beings of that period and of today as well. A very quick look at some of the pandemics that have, in fact, become a part of our experience and of our knowledge and of our understanding. Of course, we know I'm starting with the most recent one and going down the lane to go back to some of the earlier pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic of 2019, as it is raging today, we know has already taken so many lives and it continues to rage and there seems to be uh, no end to the passage. Of course, vaccines have come in, but we do not know the efficacy of those vaccines today, how long it is going to keep us safe. If you go back a few years, the SARS in 2002-2004, which broke out in China in Guangdong province bordering Hong Kong, was severe acute respiratory syndrome. That is what we well, that's a full form of SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And we know that the pandemic today also has relations to that. People who are, um, who fall victims to the COVID-19 pandemic also go through severe acute syndromes. And one of the interesting things that I found was that like COVID that began in Wuhan in China, SARS was also um, or the outbreak of SARS was also in China. When we come to H1B and AIDS in 1981, which of course set terrors all over the world, which originated in the Democratic Republic of Congo around 1920, and HIV cross species from chimpanzees to humans. So here was another uh, calamity that in the 1980s, from the 1920s to the 1980s, humanity had to face. H3N2 pandemic, which began in 1968, was caused by an influencer. And it was thought to have come from the birds, the avian flu, the virus, H3N2. And then one of the, more, what, what you call the greatest calamities, perhaps, that affected the world, was soon after the First World War, 1918 to 1919, which was called the Spanish flu. Um, in my um, search for why it was called Spanish flu, I found something that turned out to be very interesting. And I think it is also an indication of the way how media operates in a world of the beginning of the 20th century and how it operates now in the 21st century. The Spanish flu did not perhaps originate in Spain. Scientists are still unsure of its source. It could have been France, China, Britain. They are all suggested as potential birthplaces of the virus, as also the United States. When the first known case was reported at a military base in Kansas on March 11, 1980. And then why was it called Spanish flu? Newspapers were free to report the epidemic's effects in neutral Spain, but not in the rest of the other countries. 
and that is why when King Alfonso the Thirteenth fell ill, his uh, illness was communicated through newspapers and stories created a false impression of Spain as especially hard hit. And this gave rise to the name Spanish flu. In 1889, to go back a few years uh, into the 19th century, we had the Russian flu. The, the flu pandemic is also known as the Asiatic flu or Russian flu. It was a pandemic that killed about 1 million people worldwide out of a population of about 1.5 billion. And it was the last pandemic of the 19th century. Then we had the cholera pandemic in 1871, which lasted and spread all over the world until 1924, till the cholera vaccine came. We had the smallpox pandemic from 1870 to 74. To go back again a few more years to the 14th century, we have the Black Death. It was a devastating global er epidemic of bubonic plague that struck Europe and Asia in the mid 1300s. The plague arrived in Europe in October 1347, when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. It is the most fatal pandemic recorded in human history resulting in the death of up to 200 million people in Eurasia and North Africa, and peaking in Europe from 1341, 47 to 1351. I will be coming back to the Black Death uh, in a couple of the novels that I will be dealing with in the latter part of this presentation. So just keep this in mind that the Black Death was something that was an epidemic of uh, great proportions, killing up to 200 billion people. Having said that about the different pandemics that have, in fact, scored the earth for so many years, starting from the time of Christ, the time of the Greek heroes, to the present time, what we are confronted with is this notion of how does this affect us as humans? What is the knowledge space that this, these pandemics that have uh, ravaged the earth have in our understanding, in our knowledge of how it affects us? When we talk about knowledge spaces, of course, we have to understand that knowledge is something that has no boundaries. Knowledge is something which can be an ideological space, a mental space, a social space. It can even be a mathematical space of proportions. It can be a physical and geographical space. And it can also be a non-knowledge space, of what we call the practical daily life space. If you look at our own daily round of life today, it is so different from what it had been, say, a year back. What is the space, the geographical space in which we seem to be going around? What is the social relationships that we are able to sustain and keep in a world of pandemic? How is our thinking controlled? How is our psychology of the, uh, of, and our awareness of what this pandemic is controls us? What is the fear? What is the tragedy that seems to be part of our lives? So when we talk about pandemic, we have all, it is not just uh, historical details. It is not a time history that we are looking at. We are also looking at how people in different periods of history reacted to these pandemics and how imaginative writers have sought to illustrate it and to uh, describe it and uh, give it a new dimension and perception. I would like to borrow a quote from Michel Foucault at this point, where he talks about knowledge. This is his quote, I quote, there is nothing prior to knowledge because knowledge is defined by a combination of the visible and that which can be articulated 
and are unique to each stratum or historical formulation. Knowledge is a practical assemblage, a mechanism of statements and visibilities. Now, if knowledge is a practical assemblage, we are in fact, we have to think in lines of how our understanding actually controls our behavioral patterns. So there we are confronted by an indefinite multitude of spaces. Our geographical space, our economic space, we know that suddenly everybody thinks in terms of uh, their home, their space, which the, 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 but when we, at one time we talked about globalization and traveling far and wide. Travel has now become a casualty. What is the economic di dimensions that pandemics have brought to our country? When many people have gone out of jobs, how has the demographic, uh, uh, the demographic uh, uh, scale really affected us? Because population has died. The sociological, the ecological, how does environment relate to us? So we find that in every uh, mention of a pandemic, there seems to be an indefinite multitude of spaces. It is not just a sickness or an illness. It is something that has, in fact, uh, caught us in its claws and has made us realize that these claws penetrate every knowledge or thinking processes of a human being. And if that is so, how does narrators, how does story makers, and how does uh, pandemic literature address these issues? Very quickly, if you look at some of the narratives that I'm going to deal with, you will find that the positioning of the narrative narrator is very important. The narrative voice, who speaks and about whom? Is it the author? Is it a character that is uh, 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 made or a, uh, the camera eye on the location and the character that is of the narrator, the psychological space of the narrator and the narrated, the time frame binding to culture and social routine, and how does a narrator represent reality and how does he move into a world of facts. In some of the novels that I am dealing with, you find that some of them have tried to present the reality of what a pandemic is and how it affects people, the gruesome details, the suffering that they go through. Uh, but in fantasy or what we call dystopian novels, which is a uh, futuristic novels that uh, pandemics of, uh, or plagues uh, occupy a central part, we find that here we have another kind of a narrative where time dimensions are as important as spatial dimensions. To make uh, what I'm trying to say a little easier for you to understand, I've sort of divided into uh, six uh, principles of heterotopias that uh, Michel Foucault talks about. It's a simultaneous mythic and real contestation of space in which we live. How can you talk about a pandemic without being mythical? How can you talk about it without being real or reality uh, and shrouded in the descriptions. Now, the heterotopias, as you know, are uh, different from the utopias or the dystopias that we are familiar with. The utopias is always, utopia is always a better world and the dystopias is always a gruesome world. But in between, the in-between space are what we would call the head heterotopias, or Foucault calls the heterotopias. And the heterotopias are always deviants from the norm. Today we talk about prisons. Prison is a space that is a contained space. It's a deviant from the norm. It is different from our way of life. And in pandemic, what we really find is a deviant from the norm. And uh, in reading this, I also read that retirement homes are see seen as deviants from the norm old people who go and find a space for themselves and the way they live, the cultural space that they generate and they occupy is very deep. In the prisons, we also know that Hugo had talked about the panoptical vision. 
And when there is a panoptical vision, what happens is you are controlled, you are disciplined. And this is what I think our chief minister is also doing every day, coming on the TV and telling us, you have to do this. Remember, sp spatial distance, sanitization, mask. So th this is the kind of control that comes on us when we are deviating from the norm. And, and then the question is, what is normal life? Is this the norm or is the norm this what we were enjoying at one point of life a year back or two years back? As a sort of, as, as we talk about this, we talk also about the cemetery, which is a contestation of the space in which we live. Because the cemetery is both a place of life, life after death, which is also of life after life or death after life. So you are actually in a contested space when you are in a symmetry. And the symmetry is also becoming very, uh, uh, I would say something that has got into projection now because we talk about the burial of the COVID infected people. Uh, Foucault talks about how at one point of time in uh, the West, the cemeteries were very close to human habitation. But then there came a time when they were moved out into the outskirts because they sort of infringed upon human life. So there is always the sense of spatial contestation that goes on when we are talking about deviance. I'm not going uh, too much into this, but for one more thing that I want to tell you here is that we, all writers in a way, create a space of space of illusion that exposes a real space, but it is always another real space because it could be messy, it can be ill-constructed, it can be jumbled, it can be a new kind of writing that we need. Also, we find that several uh, places are just opposed uh, or time spheres are just opposed on one another. A writer talking of the here and the now may talk about a futuristic period when his characters move out into uh, a futuristic period or move out into the past. Now, this easy flow between creating characters, creating a narrative where you have time, uh, time, time scales that clash with one another, spaces that clash with one another, contest with one another. So if you look at uh, the writers, uh, these are some of the things that we uh, see uh, uh, being uh, highlighted. And I would now like to look at some of the texts that we are going to deal with. The Decameron was set during the Black Death. Remember, I talked about the Black Death as one of the earliest during the 14th century. And here, it's a time of disaster. And what happens here is 10 people move out, they self-isolate in a villa outside of Florence for two weeks during the Black Death. And in the course of their isolation, the characters take turns to tell stories, restructuring their normal everyday lives, which have been suspended due to, due to the epidemic. So you find this kind of restructuring of, your, of our, the normal everyday lives coming back again and again into the storytelling. Another writer uh, who, who has been quoted again and again, particularly uh, during these times, is Daniel Defoe. And his uh, journal, which is called A Journal of the Plague Year, it's a long detailed narrative of events, anecdotes, and statistics regarding the Great Plague of 1665. Now, I would, I would like you to uh, focus your attention on the two dates that we have here. The Great Plague of London was in 1665. Daniel Defoe wrote his book, a journal in 1772. So almost a hundred years have passed before he gives us a very realistic description. And this realistic description is based on the devastated city of London, when almost one quarter of its population in the span of 18 months had died. And 50 years later, he writes a realistic account of the plague's effect of the city. 
So a writer does not live in a period of a pandemic to write about it, but takes a period in history that goes back and then begins to write about it. This is uh, the cover of the book, uh, which is called The Journal of the Plague Year. And what is interesting in this book is, uh, Defoe actually narrates the story as though well he's an eyewitness of the events. So he, in what you would call, it's a spatial travel, or, or a, 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 what you would call a, a movement in time. Moving back as an eyewitness, 50 years back, and Defoe himself, we know, was only five years old when the Great Plague took place. And he gives us a, a, a feeling of specific neighborhoods, streets, even houses in which the events took place. He even provides us with figures and, um, yes, he even uh, gives us figures and also tells us that the media at that point of time did not allow people to spread the rumors and report of we had no such thing as printed newspapers in those days to spread rumors and reports of things, to improve them by the invention of men as I have lived to see practices many years later. And the last part it says, but it seems that the government had a true account of it and several councils were held about ways to prevent its coming over, but all was kept very private. This is very different from what we are seeing today when we are constantly being updated through the media about the numbers, about what is happening at different. Um, so, uh, so it's easy to visualize how people at that particular point of time in infected families, uh, they did not know what was happening in the rest of the world. The sense of mounting fear that they would have experienced. I'm just quoting a few lines from the Fox Journal. Before writes about families forced into quarantine due to an infected family member. I quote, it was generally in such houses that we heard the most dismal shrieks and outcries of the poor people, terrified and even frightened to death by the sight of the condition of their dearest relations and by the terror of being imprisoned as they were. Quarantine. So you are actually moving through all that and this is the number that he takes from the chronicles of the times and tells us how many died, how many were buried. And finally, for last statement that he says is this, London might well be said to be all in tears. A dreadful plague in London was in the year 65, which swept and 100,000 souls away. And yet I alive. So the narrator here, places himself in a time frame that is 50 years back from the time that he wrote the, the particular um, journal and then talks about specific places and times. Now, when you come to Mary Shelley's The Last Man, what I found very interesting here again is that this is one of the first apocalyptic no novels that tells of a future world that has been ravaged by a so in, in D4, you have a past word being brought alive through the narration. In The Last Man, we have Mary Shelley. This, uh, incidentally, the, this novel has been made into a film, and it's a very interesting film. I suggest that uh, the viewers of this program uh, see the film. It's a story of Lionel Verney. It is told by himself, the last man, alive on earth after the plague. And it's not just a plague, there is ill-fated climatic changes and inter interminable armed conflicts at the end of the 21st century. So look at the time that The Last Man was written. It was in 1826 and the novel is placed at the end of the 21st century, so even beyond our times. And around this time, by the 19th century, feelings that the plague came because of the wrath of God or supernatural powers or divine punishment or supernatural events. Uh, by the 20th century and the latter half of the 19th century, you know that uh, Charles Darwin and other uh, uh, scientists have, have come on the field. Uh, 
Bacteriologists had demonstrated they are caused by germs that infect humans. Epidemiologists and public health experts had shed light on the mechanism of disease transmission, including suggestions of general preventive measures to limit pandemic. So uh, slowly by that time, uh, the 20th century that he is envisaging. So, so it, we could say the hope uh, at the end of the last man is that he is not the last man. And we feel the same thing when we come to Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake also. The last man is not the last man because I don't think any writer would like to uh, completely wipe out uh, the human race from the face of the earth. Jack London is a writer uh, who was not very well known apart for his um, uh, stories like The Call of the Wild and The White Man. And incidentally, Jack London was one of my authors for my research topic. So I had occasion to read quite a lot of his uh, political affiliations and also the newsletters that he used to write. Uh, one, in, another, one of the interesting things that I found with his uh, writings, apart from these broad stories or about, about the snow in, in Alaska and about the hunting of the um, uh, the the uh, hunting of the whales. You find that he is not just a, a what you would say a, a writer who dapples with um, unexplored regions. He was a very very uh, conscientious uh, socialist and a politician who had very definite things to say about what was happening in America in the 1910s and the 1920s. One surprising thing is that Ernest Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald and others lived during this period, but they have not talked about uh, the plague. They did not talk about what had affected uh, the American society. And it was Jack London who was to talk to us about two very, uh, I would say, um, two very prominent things that had faded away in history, particularly with reference to what writers had to say from America. In the unparalleled invasion in 1910, Jack London describes a biological warfare campaign launched from the United States and the other Western countries to arrest the uncontrolled growth of China's population and protect European colonies in Asia from Chinese immigration. This is something that not many of us know. Anyway, I did not know that, that a biological warfare campaign had been launched from the United States as early as 1910. Today, when we talk about COVID-19, we suspect that perhaps there is a biological warfare that has been launched from China. So th this, this is an interesting uh, take on uh, the pandemic. And uh, San Francisco's Chinatown had already had an epidemic of bubonic plague. And during this epidemic, the initial denial and the obstructionism of authorities in California, who wanted to prevent the loss of revenue from trade served by quarantine, were highly criticized by the media. So by, in the 1912 itself, the American audience had, in fact, already experienced the San Francisco plague of 1900-1904. And you'll notice here, America repeated the same policy even with COVID-19 because they wanted to prevent the loss of revenue from trade and stopped quarantine. The Scarlet Plague. This is, this is something that I want to direct your attention to. The Scarlet Plague was published by Jack London in 1912. It is one of the first examples of a post-apocalyptic fiction in modern literature. The novel is set in 2073, so many years forward from even the time that we are living. And the narrator here is Gransmer, who is actually called James Howard Smith. And Gransmer is the grandfather of a group of children, his grandsons, who narrates to them the history of the plague in 2013. And Grandsir lives his past history as a projection of 2030. So you, you, the, the way in which time scales and also 
social spaces are reappropriated and contested. How you have somebody who is a grandfather who is uh, talks about a plague in 2013 to his grandchildren in 2073 and a novel that is published in 1912 which talks about the scarlet. So you have so many different time scales to so many different spaces of interaction of human experience being expressed. This is a novel in which he saw, which he was looking at the influenza pandemic in history in 1918-1920, which began it spread only six years after the publication of the scarlet. So this is again an interesting take. London wrote his novel even before the Spanish influence of 1918-1920. So the pandemic literature, as we see, is not just about the pandemic. It is also a creation of, uh, of the creative mind in trying to transcend spaces and cultural spaces, physical spaces, and trying to redraw those spaces in both pre and post time frames. This is how he describes the pandemic. This is supposed to be one of a very realistic uh, novel and a realistic novel that describes, but remember, this is a description about a pandemic that was yet to come. The people were soon frightened by, this is how it was, the astonishing quickness with which this germ destroyed human beings and by the fact that it has inevitably killed any human body in Denver. There's a graphic description which says, from the moment of the first signs of it, a man would be dead in an hour. Some lasted for several hours. Many died within 10 or 15 minutes of the appearance of the first signs. And I continue, the heart began to beat faster and the heat of the body to increase. Then came the scarlet rash, spreading like wildfire over the face and body. Most persons never noticed the increase in heat and heartbeat. And the first they knew was when the scarlet rash came out. Usually, they had convulsions at the time of the appearance of the rash. But these convulsions did not last long and were not very severe. The heels became numb first, then the legs and hips. And when the numbness reached as high as his heart, he died. A very sad very realistic description. And he also wrote about the rapid decomposition of offices, which immediately released billions of germs, accelerating the spread of the disease and causing problems for the scientists who were not able to quickly find a specific treatment. By, a, by the time a serum against the plague was discovered, it was too late to stop the epidemic. Medicine and scientific progress were defeated by plague as testified by the heroic death of bacteriologists who were killed in their laboratories, even as they studied the germ of the scarlet letter. As fast as they perished, others stepped forth and took their pictures. So it really gives us this feeling of panic and people beginning to run away from the affected places. And he, and he, and he uh, compares them to a salmon run you have seen on the Sacramento River, pouring out of the cities by millions, madly over the country. And still they carry the germs with them, wherever they went. Uh, very true to his uh, leanings as a, uh, as a socialist, he criticized to the government and the capitalists of the time for bringing about the uh, situation. And you find that the behavioral responses will actually move from fear and irrationality to a, to a selfishness, which was once a very civilized and modern society. So the, after the plague, the civilization seems to fall apart and capitalism is presented as the ultimate cause for what has happened. This is a picture that I got of the Spanish flu hospitals and and it reminded me of the 
uh, ready-made ho the hospitals that were constructed for people during the COVID-19 days. Albert Camus' Plague, in this is another very famous novel of the pandemic period. And as the title suggests, 1947, The Plague, uh, and he wrote about a cholera epidemic in Algeria in 1849. So this is a, a novel that talks about something that is past in a novel that is written in 1947. And in this novel, uh, there was a, a, a searching for Camus, I found this very interesting figure of the doctor. Uh, it's almost like our PPT kit. And the nose, uh, which protrudes, gives you the suggestion, keep your distance. Because uh, this is what we are told today as well. The caretakers, the caregivers, and their role in a society. Uh, if Jack London's novel is set in San Francisco, you find um, the plague is set in Oran, which is a large French port on the Algerian coast in the 1940s. So here again, the way in which the past gets represented, it begins with a description of the town and sets it in a geographical space beside hills. It sets it in a psychological space of inhabitants who are placid, who are numbed to emotions and passions, and they just want to make money. It refers to a social space that, around, that rotates around work and pastimes and no relationships that are binding or warm. So it's, it's, you, you are really taken into what daily ex experiences of what I had earlier said is the non-knowledge that we are uh, talking about. The next slide that I have here. Continue with the spaces that are projected. I'm going to quickly go a little fast here. Um, this town of Oran is described as a treeless, glamorless, soulless town and ends by being restful. And after a while, you go completely to sleep there. So the, the, um, the, the town itself is ravaged by dead rats. And the way in which uh, it is narrated to us day by day as to how the rats begin to uh, uh, to die uh, in hundreds and in thousands day after day. Soon everyone is talking of rats, rats dying in thousands. So Dr. Rio is the physician who really uh, is central in the novel, but only at the end of the novel do we realize that here is the narrator. And the narrator is an experiencing self who is caught within the uh, the spatiality of uh, a town like Oran, which is glamorless and soulless. And uh, as we go through the novel, some of the things that really strikes us is that uh, he reflects on the epidemic and de declares that he wrote the chronicle to simply say what we learned in the midst of plagues. There are more things to admire in men than to despise. So there's another take on what the band. This is a picture of the Black Death. And the Black Death becomes the of a science fiction that Connie Willis has written, which is called the Doomsday Book. Here again, uh, the 1300s plague years, uh, the institutional corruption, the church, how the church's money was being used and how um, the high status churchmen took advantage of the believers' hospitality, all that gets questioned. But here's a novel, which is a science fiction. And it sets the time of the novel in 2050, that's 30 years hence. Goes back to a society that is 1300. And what is interesting here is not just the, uh, the way in which the the history gets represented. It is set in two epidemics. One is in 1348 and another influenza epidemic that she foresees in 2054. And there is a future time in which the student who was sent out on the um, time mission, time travel mission, to go back in centuries 
to find herself in a town where there is a black death in the 1348s and trying to cope there and to help. So uh, pandemic literature is an attempt really to make us realize that this is not something that has um, come out of nowhere, but it is something that has been a part of our living experience. It's a part of how we try to grapple with, to contest the spaces in which we find ourselves. The last novel that I would like to look at is Margaret Atos. Uh, she's a Canadian writer. And naturally, I wouldn't have left this platform without saying something about a Canadian writer. Uh, Margaret Atwood uh, is uh, in this novel, uh, which, uh, which is called Oryx and Craig. Yes, uh, which was published in 2003. Uh, it's a near future uh, novel, but at the same time, it's a novel that takes, takes us uh, to a 2003 publication, but it is set in a new future, new England. And what is interesting here is that uh, it is a critique of how uh, bioengineering, which is appropriated and controlled by a few people, can really create post humans or what she calls humanoids, artificial beings. And here also we have Snowman as one of the last men is Jimmy in the first part of the novel. Snowman uh, takes the school of what is called uh, humanoids who are called the crackers. And the crackers are developed in what is called the paradise lab. And finally, you find that after a mm, lot of human relationships are uh, sort of sacrificed, Snowman um, makes away with the crackers to the shore a New England space. But here again, uh, he returns for supplies, but when he gets back, the children tell him that there are two or three humans still uh, uh, far away and which uh, they can see. So with the problem of sighting or placement, where you place mankind in terms of demography, the problem of human sight or living space it's not simply that of knowing whether there will be enough space for men in the world, a problem that is certainly quite important, but also that of knowing what relations of propinquity, what type of storage circulation, marking, classification of human elements should be adopted in a given situation in order to achieve a given end. So what's the kind of human being that we are talking about? How, how do we, uh, how are we um, shaped by the pan pandemic that is around us? What is the relationship that we strike with the world outside, the space outside? Especially when we talked about Galileo as talking about the sun at the center. What, what we forgot at that time perhaps to address more seriously was his notion of the infinitude the infinite space around us. This infinite space that is outside has become an infinite space of the mind. And I would, uh, I'm just showing you a picture of Henry Lefebvre's um, book, which is called The Production of Space. This will give you an idea about what I have been talking about during this one hour. How oh, everything seems to be related to one another how we cannot live in a space that is not contained and at the same time that is not open. I would like to conclude my talk with a poem that I wrote, which is titled Contained Spaces and which looks to a future that is positive and hopeful. This is the poem. Sky at my open window, so close yet so far. Stunted plants on my apartment balcony, Frayed leaves on vertical gardens on the wall. Peeping tiny buds that do not bloom. Lives contained in narrow spaces, tenderly held. Tight wrappings on girls' Chinese feet, tradition unabated. For over a millennium, Tang Dynasty, twirling feet of Yao Yang, 
to shape and size it as a golden lotus, to mark her beauty and her grace in pain. Miniature tra trays, bonsai plants pruned with care, crossing seas from China to Japan to distant lands, finding hands to create and shape it with love, pleasing to human eye, yet a grave to the tree that was born to sway to the rhythm of the wind. Cage the birds, chirping of unseen lands, mourning the lives they never had, reaching out to kindred kinds to tell the story of the circling round the cage of lost freedom and the grave of dreams. Swaying palms, trees lost in the dense forest, nestlings calling out for motherly care, sharp-eyed, hovering falcons in the air, the challenge and the battle of life out there, all lost in the safety of a caged existence. But we shall break these strangling shackles that bind us and them to narrow spaces. We shall once more reach across our hands in love, feel the comfort of warm embraces and cool air, the acceleration of wide spaces and rustling leaves. Feel and hear the resonances of the human world. Rain drenched dancing leaves on swirling branches. Reminiscences of splashing waves one-on-one -on, -one on shores. The call of fishermen and the joy of the boundless catch. Echoing the land, the sea, and the sure sky. Thank you.